Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Julie Marfell from Frontier Nursing University, and it's my great pleasure to start out um, our Nurse Practitioner Week and the beginning of the Digital Summit with a presentation about improving access to health care and how nurse practitioners are answering the call. I'm the Dean here at Frontier Nursing University. So these are my objectives for my presentation. I want to talk to you a little bit about what our NP st statistics look like right now. Talk a little bit about what our her current um, access to healthcare data looks like and that honestly it feels like it changes every week. Um, just discuss some of the barriers to access to healthcare and propose ways that nurse practitioners can continue to increase as access to healthcare. So where are we with nurse practitioner statistics? Um, I think this is very remarkable that there are 234,000 nurse practitioners here in the United States. Um, when I became a nurse practitioner in the late 90s, there were uh, 68,000 of us. So think about that, the difference. And we have more than doubled um, the number of nurse practitioners really since 2010. In 2010, I want to say we were around 179,000. And as you see here in 2017, it's 234,000. And our predicted growth is 240,000, 244,000 by 2025. Now, um, it doesn't seem like that 10,000 more is a, is a big jump, but it is. And that's with having other people retire um, and different people moving in and out of the profession. So where and what kind of nurse practitioners are we? Well, as nurse, 89% of us um, practice in primary care. If you remember correctly, um, that's one of the reasons why uh, nurse practitioners started was to be able to answer the needs of primary care, specifically in rural communities. 62% of us who practice in primary care are actually certified as family nurse practitioners. And about 20% of nurse family nurse practitioners uh, practice in prim private group practices. So they usually practice in their own practice or they practice in a uh, medical group, physician's group. For the women's healthcare nurse practitioners, it's not a huge amount of uh, WHNPs. 2.5% of the primary care workforce for NPs are um, women's healthcare nurse practitioners. And about 3.5% of them um, practice in a private group practice. And um, the newest uh, advanced practice nurses as far as family nurse practitioners and specifically nurse practitioners, are the psych mental health family nurse practitioners. So these are people that are um, dual certified or I should say they're psychiatric uh, mental health nurse practitioners that um, practice across the lifespan. And um, it's only about 2.4% of the total number of nurse practitioners are psych mental health. And about 32% of them actually work in a psychiatric mental health care facility. So where do we practice? Well, in 2000, 20% of the U.S. population lived in rural areas. And that really hasn't changed too much from 2010, which was about 19%. Um, the thing that has changed that is in 20, 2000, about 59% of um, nurse practitioners were located in rural areas. There was about 59%. It's only 47% um, actually at this point in time in that to, from 2000 to 2010. So we've seen a decrease in the number of primary care providers in rural areas. We've also seen a decrease in the number of physicians that actually um, practiced in rural areas. It, um, in 2000 was 13.1 phys physicians for every 10,000 rural citizens. Um, and that is in comparison to 31.2 uh, in urban areas. So you can see the big discrepancy. There's a lot more physicians per 10,000 in urban areas currently than there are physicians um, in rural areas, 13.1%. So there's a shortage. There's a, a shortage and um, it's a big need. So when you think about predictions in terms of the need for healthcare providers, what does that look like? So as I said earlier, 89% of nurse practitioners right now are practice are prepared in primary care. That's opposed to 14.5% of physicians that are prepared in primary care. That number has continued to drop. There's a predicted shortage of um, primary care physicians. So um, in 2025, um, there's a shortage of 23,640 full-time equivalents for physicians. 
And the good news is that nurse practitioners, there's um, going to be an increase in 19% in growth um, by 2025. Matter of fact, they're saying there's going to be an oversupply of family nurse, of nurse practitioners in general um, by 2025. And that's newer HRSA data. That's from 2016. So there's been discussion for many, many years about the attributes of nurse practitioners as healthcare providers and did a lot of reading. And I will say that multiple studies in the past 20 years, and I would argue even longer than that, if you look at the, look at the literature, um, nurse practitioner care is equal or better in specific instance, instances than care provided by physicians, specifically in rural health. There has been study after study that shows that the satisfaction, the health healthcare outcomes, all those pieces are equal between physicians and nurse practitioners. And in some areas, we do a better job. Um, so there's no question about that. You know, with an oversupply of nurse practitioners, we can certainly fill that healthcare need for primary care. So if you talk about access to care, um, right now there are. Um, 600, 6,400 health professional shortage areas in the United States. So that's places where there's not enough healthcare providers. And 66 million Americans have limited access to primary care providers. Now, this is 2016 data. So this is will, still with the ACA. Um, who knows how it's going to be if any of the healthcare reform changes um, in the next three to four years. Um, but this is where it stands right now. So even right now with the ACA intact, pretty much 66 million Americans have limited access to primary care. And limited access sometimes is location, sometimes it's cost, it's whether or not they have insurance, um, the right kind of provider. So there's lots of pieces to this 66 million, but it's a shortage. It's a shortage of primary care providers. It's a shortage of specialists in some areas. It's definitely a shortage of psychiatric mental health providers. So um, the need is there. And I'm here to tell you that I think we're here to answer the call. So if you look at the nurse, nurse practitioner care applied to a provider shortage, um, nurse practitioners in rural care do not replace physicians, but again, studies have demonstrated that nurse practitioners can manage 80 to 90 percent of the care provided by primary care physicians, and that was in 2013. So here we are. We're ready to go. Um, we have the numbers, and we need to start thinking big and really think about how we can get out there and make sure these individuals have access to care. So the first thing to increase access is to really look at our scope of practice regulations. It is um, remarkable to me that we still have, it's 24 states that have full scope practice for NPs. It's better. We, I believe, gained three, three other states last year, and there's lots of legislation that's in the planning for um, the upcoming year. In Kentucky alone, our legislation um, will begin in January, and we have already been meeting um, with key people in the state capitol because we would like to have full scope practice um, this year in Kentucky. Uh, we still are working with a collaborative agreement. If you have not been out of school for five years, um, you still need a collaborative agreement. Um, it's better. It's not as limited as it has been in the past, but it's still limited on our scope of practice. Here's the picture of the map. Um, I don't know about you, but I take a look at this every year to see where we're at. And you can see we have made some definite um, advantages. The dark blue um, states now outnumber the other states. Well, just about. We're one off to be an equal. Um, but as, you, as I said, there's plans in the works. Um, to be able to move move things forward um, with the reduced practice states and also with the ones who really have restricted restricted practice as well. So, you know, we need to keep working at this. If you um, are not involved with your state um, advanced practice group, please get involved. Um, sometimes all you have to do is make phone calls. Sometimes you have to go for lobby day. Sometimes you want to give money. And sometimes you need to do all three. In Kentucky this year, it's a year for all three. Um, to be able to give to our PAC, which is new here in Kentucky this year, to be able to go to Lobby Day, which is in February. And I don't know, you all remember, you just keep the um, switchboard number in your phone. And when you get the email, you just start calling and it makes a big difference because they look at their stack of paper for all the green, green sheets that says people are in favor of this bill and they count them. And that really does influence your representative. 
the representatives are still home. We haven't been back in section, session yet in Kentucky and probably in other places as well. Now is the time to visit them. And remember, they work for you. You don't work for them. They work for you. So they need to hear your voice. And if we're going to really increase access to care, we need to increase with our scope of practices. We need to be able to practice at the highest extent of our education and our licenses. So oh, we're getting there. We really are. Um, but we're not there yet. So please be active. Um, you can look at the states where practice is resti restricted. There are not as many NPs in those states, and their healthcare outcomes are not as good. That's documented in the literature as well. Um, the outcomes are not as good in states that have restricted practice, and um, nurse practitioners leave those states and go to states where they can have um, be able to practice to the fullest extent of their license and education. So um, remember that we have to keep trying to work on this and to make things better. So another way to answer the call is to improve the quality and the efficiency of your practice. Um, nurses, that, nurse practitioners that practice in nurse managed health centers um, usually practice in areas that have a lack of access to care. That's why those nurse managed health centers are put there. Not always, but many times that's what it is. And nurses who practice in nurse managed, nurse practitioners who practice in nurse managed health centers really um, typically will um, practice to the, their full scope of practice, so to their full education and license and for whatever state that they're in. Um, and you see improved, improved quality and efficiency in nurse managed health centers. Um, one of the things that a nurse managed health center has is you usually have your own panel of patients. So you're in charge of a panel of patients. You don't see whoever comes in the door. You don't see um, the other providers' patients. Um, you have your own panel. Yeah, you may see, you know, do walk-ins and maybe pick other up other people's patients, but typically you have your own panel of patients, the people that follow you, um, and you get good continuity. Um, you get people who will come back. You have, um, according to the literature, you're able to see that people will follow their treatment plans if you have that consistency in providers. It makes a big difference. Um, so it helps the efficiency of your practice. You don't have as many no-shows. So you're able to maintain um, that panel. Uh, there are some places, though, that do not allow you to do that. When you're negotiating for a job, ask, insist that you have your own panel of patients. Sometimes you have to work up to it, um, but if you show them the information, they will say, wow, that's probably a good idea because it has been shown to improve practice and practice outcomes, healthcare outcomes. You also want to make sure you have the resources that are necessary to deliver care. You don't want to be the person that's rooming your patients and drawing the blood and giving the immunizations. Um, you want to make sure that you have other people to help you do that. You can have anywhere from a 9% to a 12% um, decrease in the efficiency of your work if you do not have someone who's actually helping you um, be able to to get patients in and out. You know, you're not being paid to, to do that work. You're being paid to um, be an advanced practice nurse. So being able to use your skills makes a big difference. And it takes a lot of time to room patients and do the other things that need to happen. So you want to make sure that that's happening as well. That's part of the support that you want to ask from for management and other providers in your practice. Um, those are two things that help you to be supported is having someone there to help you. Um, also, just to be able to have somebody to collaborate with, whether it's another nurse practitioner, whether it's a phys physician, um, you know, whether it's a social worker, but being having somewhere there, someone there that can be part of your team to help you with things that um, your patient may need that you're not, not um, able to provide makes a big difference as well, too. Um, again, and having those resources available um, to deliver that care. You need to be able to utilize those advanced practice skills. You need to be able to function at the highest level of your education and license, and you will see that you can increase the number of patients that you see, um, and you also see better healthcare outcomes. It's also very important to have a mutual vision of care and of teamwork and what a supportive work environment looks like. So being able to meet with your team, some places meet every day, just for a five-minute huddle in the morning, make sure everybody's where they need to be, they have have the kind of resources they need, um, and then to check in period per periodically throughout the day. It's a good it's a good way to do things. Sometimes if you can even do that weekly, even if you can meet with people monthly, having that shared vision of how the practice should run, on how you should practice, um, how to work as a team, and being able to support each other makes a big difference in your healthcare out outcomes. And if you have good healthcare outcomes, your patients come back, 
um, they get well, they follow their treatment plans, and um, you will also be increasing access to care because you will stay in that environment and you will increase the number of times that you increase the number of patients that you actually see. So you make a big difference in your community. Important stuff. The other thing um, that needs to be worked on is reimbursement policies. Um, I cannot believe, after being a nurse practitioner since 1994, that it's still 85% of the physician's fee schedule is what we get paid by Medicare. I just have to say it. It's not right. It needs to change. Um, and we have to just keep working on it, working on it on all different levels, and there's all different levels to it. If you think about Medicaid, Medicaid actually varies state to state. And some states, um, nurse practitioners are not even recognized as primary care providers. Um, the National Governors Association meant in 2012, this is one of the things that they wanted to change, was to make things so that it was 100% um, of what a physician fee schedule is. Um, it's still not that way in many states. And again, not even being recognized as a primary care provider really does not help access to care because many times some of the places that we work, Medicaid is one of our number one payers. Um, so it's very difficult if you're not getting 100% of Medicaid. Medicaid is usually a de decreased fee as well. So um, we have to keep working on these issues. And this surprised me is 25% of health maintenance organizations do not credential nurse practitioners as primary care providers. So that means that you're working under the um, auspices of the physician's license and billing incident two. Incident two, you should not do it. Um, if you have to do it, you need to make sure you do it right. That means that the physician's got to see the person the first time, the physician has to be consulted, the physician has to be in the area, in the building. Um, there's all kinds of rules to it, and um, it's hard to do. And you certainly don't want to um, be accused of insurance fraud. Nobody does. So I would recommend trying not to do incident two. But if you've got um, health maintenance organizations that don't even recognize you or will credential you, um, you should not be seeing their patients because you're not going to get paid for it. We have to change this. We do. And again, I'm showing up, calling, um, talking to your legislators, and trying to make them understand that if they really want healthcare to and to healthcare access to improve, these are some of the issues that we have to work on. It's not just about my scope of practice. It's about this. It's being able to be reimbursed um, at a level that I can keep my doors open, that I can see patients, and I get paid for my work, and that the patients get seen. They deserve that. So the diversity of the workforce is another issue um, that we need to continue to work on. Um, racially and, and a racial, racially and ethnically diverse healthcare workforce improves, improves healthcare outcomes. Um, you will see increased patient satisfaction. You will see better utilization of services. And again, you're going to see an increased adherence to treatment plans. Um, it's important because many of the underserved areas may be areas where um, people have health disparities. They may have um, health disparities, um, educational disparities. They're not getting the kind of care that they need. They're not having access to care. So being able to work in these areas means that we have to diversify the workforce. And it's so important to be able to stay in your community, to be educated and stay in your community because people know you, they trust you. Um, you can make a big difference as a nurse practitioner by staying where it is that you live. So that's why one of our focuses here at Frontier is able to educate people in rural areas. We know that if you live in a rural area and you stay in a rural area for your education, chances are you're not going to leave that rural area. So you're going to stay there and make a difference in your community. So think about that. Again, diversifying the workforce, making sure that there's people from their community that are actually working with those patients in their communities. It's it's a big difference. It makes a big difference. And we're very fortunate here at Frontier that we were um, given a HRSA grant this last year to uh, diverse, help diversify the nursing works, workforce. So stay tuned. We're making a big difference now. We went from, I believe, 15% to 19% um, of our uh, students as far as diversity. We've increased it, and you know we want to be inclusive in any way that we can. So try to be that for yourselves and for those people that you see as well, and encourage everyone in your community that wants to become a nurse practitioner that they should do it, and then you know, as I, we always say, you know, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. So make sure that you help them um, 
get to their goals and uh, precept them. You knew you wouldn't get by hearing from me without saying precept people, but it is. You want to answer the call. You want to keep people in their communities and help them um, be able to stay and help their communities. So again, our work is not done. Um, there's a lot to do, but I think we're all up for it. And as we celebrate this Nurse Practitioner Week, I think we need to remember that we need to be present. So when you need to show up at the lobby day or a meeting or in a meeting in your practice, wherever it is, you need to show up and get involved. Um, I've always said that if you turn your back on some of these scope of practice issues, these reimbursement issues, um, the diversity issues, if you turn your back, you may turn around again and the things that you thought that were there are gone because they can change. So stay involved, be present, and speak up. You need to speak up. You need to speak up in your practices. You need to speak up on lobby day. Um, you need to call your representatives. You need to be active in your nursing organizations, in the nursing organizations, the advanced practice organizations. Um, we need you. We need you to do that. So be ready to answer the call. And this is a quote from Mrs. Breckenridge that um, I particularly care for, and I think it's very true. Uh, the thing we want most, more than all of our plans, is to be better the work we do in the years to come. And being able to answer the call and to address these issues will make a difference. We'll make a difference now, and it'll make a difference in the um, years to come for those folks that are coming behind us to be able to continue our work. So please, 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 please um, enjoy this week. Make sure that you remember why you started doing this in the first place. Um, make sure you remember that it's not just about seeing the patients. It's about setting the environment that you see the patients. It's about being reimbursed for our services. It's about diversifying the workforce. And it's about making sure that we can practice to the full scope of our education and licensure. So thank you very much. These are my references. And um, www.frontier.edu, you can find me there, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Take care and thank you. Enjoy Nurse Practitioner Week. It's a chance to celebrate. <laughs>